Who is your hero? What image would come to your mind? Someone endowed with superhuman powers dressed in colorful costume? A soldier or sailor who fights for a noble cause? A parent, teacher, police officer, or firefighter who protects and serves the community? Or is it, perhaps, someone else altogether? Regardless of your answer, above all, our heroes are a reflection of our own personal ideals. They embody the best qualities of humanity, and they remind us that we can become more than even we think we are. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> can I help you, ma'am? Uh, no, no, just looking. Do you know, I've lived in this area for, well, since before you were even born, and this is the first time I've ever been to this place. Well, better late than never, ma'am. So, what do you think? Every city should have a place like this to commemorate our heroes. You're staring at me. I'm sorry, have we met before, ma'am? No, I don't think so. Are you sure? Because you look awfully familiar to me. Listen, Sonny, I may be up there in years, but I'm still pretty sharp. Don't you have a tour to conduct or something? Oh, not for another few minutes or so. So, what, you just get a kick out of pestering old ladies? Actually, I just like looking at these displays. Think of it, every face up there has done something to distinguish itself on land and at sea. What about in the air? In the air? Yeah, you know, pilots. Oh, absolutely. In fact, uh, quite a few have made it in here. Sometimes our heroes deserve more than recognition. They deserve resolution. First World War, people were in need of heroes, and aviators helped fulfill that need. In those days, there were many notable flying aces, but few have had quite the enduring impact of Amelia Earhart. Born into the family of a Kansas attorney, Amelia Earhart defied convention and became an accomplished pilot at a time when such a thing was not considered ladylike. In 1928, she made headlines by becoming the first woman to fly across the Atlantic as a passenger. Following her historic transatlantic flight, Amelia Earhart began setting her own aviation records and became the driving force behind numerous philanthropic endeavors. In 1929, she helped organize the first all-woman air race across the United States, what humorist Will Rogers famously dubbed the Powder Puff Derby. Amelia's congenial, self-effacing personality won her many friends, especially among the aviatrixes she had raced against. One of those women was McKeesport, Pennsylvania native, Helen Ritchie the first female pilot to be employed by a commercial airline. In the years that followed, the pair flew together in many air races and became close confidants, sharing their many joys and frustrations. I'm glad you took the propeller apart, Ray. 
everything needs to be checked and rechecked when you're getting ready for a big race. You're absolutely right, Ms. Earhart. You never know what you might miss. Excuse me for a moment. I've got to look for a smaller set of wrenches. I want to have Ray tighten down the overhead hatch some more. Felt loose. Seemed fine to me, Helen. Just want to be sure. We don't want any trouble over Kansas now, do we, Amelia? Helen, will you please stop fussing? If you could pull it down at 18,000 feet, I'm sure I'll have no trouble. Could we just get off the subject of altitude, please? I'm sorry, Helen. I'm not angry with you, Amelia. It just reminds me of how quickly a record can change. 18,448.107 feet. That was the official record. Boy, was that ever short-lived. Four months later, Irene Crump flies over Gallipolis, Ohio at an altitude of 19,246 feet. Four months, less than 800 feet difference, and <laughs> just like that, I'm history. There will be other records, Helen. Trust me on that. Everything in my life is short-lived, Amelia. Do you remember Central Airlines? I applied in 34. Nine months later, over. Case closed, just shut out by all the male pilots. Can you imagine being confined to flying in only sunny skies? <laughs> oh, that really pissed me off. <laughs> Let's just face it, Amelia. They did everything they could to deter me. But the straw that broke the camel's back was when they all decided that I wasn't strong enough. I know. And you broke more records to get your wings than any of them ever did. That is, if they even attempted any. What to do anymore? I'm just so damn frustrated. Remember when I told you about transcontinental air transport? The Ludington Line and my Boston to Bangor route in 31? Yeah. Well, maybe we should explore that a little more. Perhaps the time has come. Are you going to say what I think you're going to say? You bet I am. Jackie, Louise, Blanche, you and me. Why can't we establish a women's airline? Gene Vidal, you remember him? How could I ever forget a good looking guy like that? Well, I ran the idea past him some time ago, and he thinks we definitely have the opportunity to attract more women to fly with us than any other airline around. I've been a Goodwill ambassador for years, telling women of all ages how safe and convenient flying is today. This could be our golden opportunity, Helen. Who knows? Maybe someday women will even transport planes in times of war. In Europe, the Air Corps policies are way ahead of us. Women can do everything and are very accepted. Hey, we're pretty strong-willed gals here, too. If we could just rally together and stay focused, never give up. What's our motto? If you can't go through it, go over it or around it. Now you have it. <laughs> <laughs> here comes Ray. We better get back to getting this plane in shape. Sorry it took me so long. Hey, Amelia, didn't Ray say he was going to get us some coffee? Did I say that? Ooh. Loss of memory. Not a good sign for someone your age. I'll go get you some. Too late, Ray. You had your chance and you blew it. <laughs> <laughs> In January 1935, Amelia Earhart was preparing for her boldest feat to date a 2,400-mile solo flight across the Pacific Ocean from Hawaii to California. Although Amelia and her husband, publisher George Palmer Putnam, tried to keep their plans under wraps, the press somehow got wind of them. And they were quick to condemn the endeavor as both pretentious and foolhardy, especially in the light of the 1927 Dole Air Derby, which followed the similar route and ended in disaster for many of its participants. Stories led to speculation. Speculations turned into rumors, and rumors became outright lies. <laughs> Tell me the pineapple's fresh and delicious today. George, Amelia, am I ever glad I ran into you this morning? Why, what's the matter? 
You're not going to believe this. I had dinner last night with an old business associate, and he told me that a rival Hawaiian organization is trying to discredit your participation in this week's race from Hawaii to California. How? Why? All I want to do is fly my Vega by myself across the Pacific. How can they possibly discredit that? They're claiming you sold out to various Hawaiian sugar companies for the passage of lower tariff rates on their product back to the good old U.S. of A. That's insane! How could I do that? They read the papers here. They know you've got connections in Washington. It's just that simple. I'll handle this, Amelia. No, wait. I'll take care of it myself. Call the local newspapers and have them send a reporter to the town square in one hour. I have a statement of my own to make that will clear this matter up quickly. There's an aroma of cowardice in the air. You know as well as I that the rumor is trash. But if you can be intimidated, it might as well be true. Whether you live in fear or defend your integrity is your decision. And I have made mine. This week, I will fly to California. Amelia's compelling speech ensured that her sponsors would not withdraw their support of the flight. And on January 11th, she arrived safely in Oakland, California, thus silencing the naysayers. Not bad, huh? Who is she? Me. Who do you think? I meant the woman standing next to you. Oh, just an old friend. While on a lecture tour in August 1935, Amelia was approached by Edward C. Elliott, then president of Purdue University, who offered her a threefold position at his school guest lecturer, advisor in the field of aeronautics, and counselor on activities for women after college. It is well documented that Amelia's lectures were consistently overbooked, and when she stayed at South Hall on the Purdue campus, she would often hold informal meetings over refreshments with some of the school's many female students. You've made a very bold move. Just imagine what you'll be able to accomplish with it. Well, if I may be presumptuous for a moment, I suppose you already know all about me. <laughs> so right. why don't you all tell me a little bit about yourselves? I'm just dying to know who my hostesses are, what you're studying, and what your intended career paths are. Okay, well, my name is Lois, and I'm studying nursing. One day, I hope to be in charge of an entire ward at a major city hospital. My name is Rosemary, Miss Earhart. I am studying writing and literature, and someday I hope to be a reporter for a magazine or newspaper. Well, I definitely hire you. 
But you'd have to promise to only run good stories. <laughs> what about you, Kathy? Business is where my interest lies, especially accounting. In fact, one day, I'd like to teach business courses. My goodness, and here I thought I was ambitious. <laughs> if you think that's something, wait till you hear Martha's big dream. <laughs> well, Martha, how about it? I'm studying chemistry, Miss Earhart, and one day through research I hope to maybe develop a cure for a life-threatening disease. No doubt you'll all make great strides in your areas of study. The future of this society is in good hands with students such as yourselves. I recently joined an organization called Zunta International. Have any of you heard of it? Well, it was founded in 1919 for the express purpose of encouraging educational and professional opportunities for young women. I brought along some of their information for you to review. Today, more than ever, we're in dire need of more nurses, reporters, accountants, and even researchers as we step further into the 20th century. Our mothers weren't afforded these opportunities, and it is our duty to keep up with, and when possible, even surpass men. <laughs> Girls, by sticking together, we can and will accomplish our goals. As a dear friend of mine by the name of Jackie Cochran would say, carry out all your convictions and don't let anyone derail your destiny. Oh, they won't. <laughs> I'm with you. We've worked way too hard to not keep going. I, for one, will never give up my goals. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> Throughout the years, I've gathered, as you can see, a few articles about some of the women who, I'm sure you'll all agree, have made their marks in our country's history. Eleanor Roosevelt, Babe Diedrichsen, Susan B. Anthony, Dorothea Lange, each of them unique in their own way. What I'm trying to point out to you this evening is that all of us at this table share their dedication. I like to think that a victory for one woman is a victory for all women. <laughs> here, here, here. 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 <laughs> this girl is my mentor. Her name is Frances Perkins. When I worked as a young social worker at the Denison House in Boston, Miss Perkins taught me so much about humanity that I shall never forget. Today, she is Secretary of Labor in Washington, D.C., <laughs> serving in the cabinet. She's truly a modern woman role model for us all. <laughs> By the fall of 1936, aviation had come a long way from the days of the Wright brothers. Thanks in part to the efforts of Amelia Earhart, the airplane was finally gaining respectability as both a passenger transport and weapon of war. Still, Amelia couldn't resist the challenge of setting one more record being the first woman to fly solo around the world. Although aviator Wiley Post had already circumnavigated the globe in both 1931 and 1933, Amelia proposed to follow a flight path that paralleled the Earth's equator as closely as possible, a route that no other aviator, man or woman, had ever attempted. Unfortunately, her first attempt in that flight in March 1937 proved disastrous. Amelia lost control of the specially built Lockheed Electra that Purdue University had entrusted to her and crashed. Although neither Amelia nor her navigator Fred Noonan were hurt in the accident, it was nonetheless a spiritually and financially devastating setback.
Amelia! There you are. Are you okay? Everything was looking so good. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe a tire blew out? Or the fuel shifted? I don't know. You don't know, Amelia? Do you realize how much money it's going to take to fix that plane? Where the hell are we going to get it? We milked everyone we knew to get the thing in the first place. Thousands. My god, thousands! Money, money, money! That's all you ever talk about, George. I'm sick of hearing it. I don't want to hear it anymore. We'll never get the plane ready in time to complete the flight and get the book written by Christmas. Just let me think, George. Let me think. The exact circumstances surrounding Amelia's crash remain in debate. Amelia herself was convinced that the plane's right hand gear had collapsed. And while some in the press claimed that one of her tires blew out, many others cited pilot error, a sentiment regrettably echoed by her own close friend and technical advisor, Paul Mance. Still, Amelia remained undeterred. Her Electra was repaired, and although she and George were both physically and emotionally exhausted from an extensive six-month-long fundraising campaign in June of 1937, they were ready to try again. all out of control. The President is right behind me, Admiral King. All right. I think we can dispense with protocol, McRae. Please be seated. Mr. President. I have just received an urgent wire from Captain Miles of the Itasca, stationed at Midway. Please, Harry, continue. Admiral King, 
British plane has been shot down near Meliato by the Imperial Japanese Navy. At this time, it's uncertain if there are any survivors. The Itasca is en route to Miliato as we speak, sir. I'm sure that the British are en route as well. Earhart and Noonan had to have seen the Japanese ships as they approached the Gilbert Islands from New Guinea. But what about the radio communications from them? That's where everything went to hell. Damn it, this wasn't supposed to happen. I want answers, I want answers now. Mr. President, the Itasca picked up several of Earhart's messages, but each was sent on a separate frequency and so badly garbled that the radio man couldn't pinpoint her exact position. It was none on any of the messages. No, they didn't pick him up, sir. I'll bet that he convinced her to turn in a southeasterly direction for a different vector. That's the logical course to take under the circumstances. That should most certainly have gotten him out of a dangerous situation. Yes, but by then it would have been too late. Here's the southeastern position. Wheels up on Hull Island is the last part of the message the radio men could make out. Which perhaps makes that the destination they were trying to reach? That's what I think. Of course, the uh, Tasker's orders were to be stationed between the Gilbert Islands for any drop. She was so close to Howland, too. Dear God, what a tragedy. Well, we've had reports of typhoon conditions throughout the entire area for the last 24 hours. Well, I'm sure that didn't help the last leg of the flight either. Noonan's flown the Pacific for years. He's no stranger to typhoons. But was air burnt? Weather? Japanese? British plane in the area? What else could have gone wrong? As many ships as you can in the direction of the Phoenix Gilbert Marshall Islands, Admiral King. Grace put out a press release that Earhart's plane was lost. The air and sea search is underway. Yes, Mr. President. Things are only going to get worse. I'm sure the Japanese have them both by now. Alive, hopefully. For how long? For how long? at sea. Here is the news for this Saturday, the 3rd of July, 1937. Reports are now coming over the wire that aviatrix Amelia Earhart has been lost somewhere over the Pacific Ocean. Earhart and her navigator, Fred Noonan, were last seen taking off from Ley, New Guinea in the South Pacific yesterday and were due to make landfall on Howland Island today. We will continue to follow this story as the facts come to light. To repeat, Amelia Earhart and her navigator, Fred Noonan, have been lost at sea. Days turn into weeks. On July 18, 1937, the government officially called off its search for Amelia Earhart. Months turned into years, and though George Putnam would continue his own fruitless search for her, even as he entered the service at the outset of the Second World War, on January 5, 1939, George Palmer Putnam had his wife, Amelia Earhart, declared legally dead. To this day, the circumstances surrounding the disappearance of Amelia Earhart remain the subject of much speculation and debate. Some hold to the belief that her around-the-world flight was a front for a government spying mission though the evidence supporting this idea remains circumstantial at best. Nevertheless, Amelia Earhart's numerous aeronautical and philanthropic accomplishments have secured her place in history and continue to make her an inspiration and a hero to generations. It's just that on the way back, I 
I decided to take the scenic route. The only person I know who wanders away from her own birthday party. Well, excuse me if I prefer not to be reminded of my age. Birthday party? I knew you looked familiar. You're Rosemary Pierce Holly, aren't you? We read your autobiography in my 20th century history class. You have my sincerest apologies. <laughs> no, it was terrific. The first female editor of a major metropolitan newspaper, and, and then a national magazine, and finally a best-selling author? Wow, what a story. Well, none of it would have been possible if it hadn't been for... Which reminds me, would you see to it that this is put on prominent display here? Grandma Rose, are you sure? Yes, Amelia. She deserves a place here as much as any of these others. Nice meeting you. 